In D&D 5e, you can take feats instead of increasing your ability scores whenever you reach a level that allows you to do so. They're used to further customize and build your character in ways that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Some can increase your effectiveness in combat by allowing you to bypass resistances when dealing damage, for instance, while other feats might be taken for roleplay and flavorful purposes. It is video going over feats that don't necessarily increase your damage output, but instead provide more utility and variety to your character as you progress. And at number 10, we have Heavy Armor Master, a feat that's all about mitigating damage while wearing heavy armor. You get to increase your strength score by 1 to a maximum of 20, and you gain the ability to reduce any non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks by 3 points. On paper, this feat works extremely well for mitigating damage, and can even save your life in certain circumstances. Since the feat procs every time you take damage from non-magical physical attacks, it's a great way to reduce the amount of damage you take in a single round. If an enemy hits you with all three of their attacks from a multi-attack, that would be 9 points of damage that you wouldn't take, which can make a huge difference at lower levels. You can also combine this feature with others that also reduce damage taken, such as the Goliath's Stone Endurance feature that allows you to use a reaction in order to reduce the damage of attack by 1d12 plus your constitution modifier. Or you can combine it with the Battlemaster's Fighter's Parry maneuvers, which allows you to reduce damage using your reaction. The biggest downside of this feat, however, is the fact that reducing damage by 3 points becomes less and less important as you level up, as more enemies will not only be making more attacks, but they'll also be dealing more damage as well. Not to mention the fact that enemies are also going to start favoring damage that's either of a damage type that isn't bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing, or magical variants of the aforementioned damage types, which will render this feat useless in many circumstances as you grow stronger. But if you're encountering a bunch of swarms, then this feat might actually excel, especially if every swarm decides to attack you. Swarms are basically a bunch of the same enemy type grouped up together in one stat block and can occupy the same space as other creatures, along with some other benefits and restrictions. However, they're balanced by having relatively low attack power as a result, which means you'll be able to tank a lot of hits a lot more comfortably than you would if you didn't have the Heavy Armor Master. To summarize, this feat works really well at lower levels when you're taking less damage overall, or in scenarios where you'll be taking a lot of love taps from enemies, but kind of falls off later on when enemies start becoming stronger, or flat out ignores the damage type altogether, which is why this feat only makes the number 10 spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Defensive Duelist. All this feat does is allow you to use a reaction in order to add your proficiency bonus to your AC whenever you're hit with a melee attack, as long as you're wielding a finesse weapon that you're proficient in. There's not really too much to say about this feat, as all it does is allow you to potentially turn a hit into a miss, which can be very useful if you're a rogue or any other type of character that likes to wield a finesse weapon like a dagger, whip, or rapier. And unlike the shield spell, which allows you to add a flat 5 AC against all attack rolls until the start of your next turn, this feat only lasts for one attack. However, being able to potentially mitigate one attack per round can still be pretty good, as it means you won't die as quickly, which makes this an excellent tool for something like a swashbuckler rogue, who tend to favor getting into creatures' faces and grabbing their attention. So, like Heavy Armor Master, the uses for this are a bit limited in terms of how you can use the feat. However, unlike Heavy Armor Master, you do get more use out of this feat as the campaign progresses, since it scales off of your proficiency and can be used on any melee attack roll, including magical ones, making this feat only slightly higher on this list in comparison. And at number 8, we have the Chef Feat. This feat allows you to increase your Wisdom or Constitution score by 1 to a maximum of 20, while also granting you proficiency with cooking utensils if you don't have it already. As part of a short rest, you can prepare food to a number of creatures equal to 4 plus your proficiency bonus that grants your party an extra 1d8 of healing whenever a creature provided a meal for spends 1 or more hit die to regain hit points. And with 1 hour of work, or whenever you finish a long rest, you can cook a number of treats equal to your proficiency bonus that, when consumed as a bonus action, grants that creature temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus, allowing them to have a small buffer of health at the start of the day. This feat doubles as both a flavor feat as well as a generally useful one by giving your party members a temporary benefit, as well as some extra healing during short rest, which is all you can really ask for when it comes to good feats. So, if you have a character that loves to dabble in the culinary arts every now and again, this feat is a perfect fit. And an extra 1d8 healing per short rest is 1d8 more hit points that you wouldn't have had before this feat which can help conserve your party member's hit dice just a little bit better. The temporary hit points granted from this feat are kind of low, when compared to other ways you can obtain temporary hit points, but to put this into another perspective, being able to mitigate a total amount of damage equal to your proficiency times the amount of party members you have, assuming you make enough treats for your entire party, is actually pretty good. So if you make treats for you and three other party members, if we assume you have a proficiency of four, you can effectively mitigate a total of 16 hit points of damage spread across you and your friends. And you can do this as part of a long or short rest since it only takes an hour to cook up these special treats, so there's no hindrance or extra work involved in making this feat work. Plus, while not really an effect of this feat, having a chef in the party could be very useful when it comes to boosting overall morale of the party just before or during a dungeon crawl. 
as fighting on an empty stomach isn't really optimal for budding or even experienced adventuring parties alike. This feat's ability to provide a fantastic flavor option for characters with a love for cooking, as well as additional benefits throughout the day, is why this feat makes this list, even if it's not the most useful feat you can take. And at number 7, we have Gift of the Metallic Dragon, a feat introduced in Fizzbang's Treasury of Dragon sourcebook. When you take this feat, you're granted access to the Cure Wound spell, which you can cast without expending any spell slots once per long rest. You can also use your own spell slots in order to cast a spell, and the spell casting modifier for Cure Wounds bonus healing depends on your choice of intelligence, wisdom, or charisma whenever you first take this feat. The second thing this feat allows you to do is manifest wings that can protect you and your allies by letting you use a reaction to add your proficiency bonus to the AC of you or your ally within 5 feet of you that gets hit with an attack, potentially causing the attack to become a miss instead. And you can do this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended charges whenever you finish a long rest. This feat basically works like Defensive Duelist, except you can also use it in order to protect your friends from harm as well, and comes with less restrictions on how it can be triggered. Defensive Duelist requires you to be hit with a melee attack in order to be able to defend against it, while Gift of the Metallic Dragon requires any attack roll, which can include ranged spells and attacks as well. The only caveat is that you can't use it every single round due to the limited amount of uses per long rest. However, this is still quite good when used to mitigate incoming damage that might otherwise be fatal to someone in your backline. The other restriction is that you do need to be within 5 feet of the one you wish to protect, which can limit who you can protect depending on your class. A ranged build might use this to protect their mages and healers, or other ranged allies, while more upfront builds, like barbarians, can make better use of this alongside their paladins and melee based rogues. And the fact that, unlike defensive duelists, you don't need to be proficient in any kind of weapons in order to be able to trigger this reaction, making this so much more versatile and easier to use. And that's not to mention access to a free casting of Cure Wounds regardless of whatever class you are, since you choose which spellcasting ability you want to use out of the three options you're given. So a fighter with a decent charisma can still make use of the once per long rest cure wounds, or a wizard with a high intelligence can take this feat and have access to a long range cure wounds through the use of the familiar, if they have one summoned through the use of the find familiar spell, by having that familiar cast the cure wound spell as their reaction. And then, of course, you can use your own spell slots in order to cast more frequent cure wounds, or even higher intensity versions by upcasting and increasing the healing done in order to help alleviate a bit of the weight your main healer might be pulling. The reason why this feat only takes number 7 spot on this list, however, is because of the nature of the feat itself. This feat, along with its two brothers, Gift of the Gem Dragon and Gift of the Chromatic Dragon, are all dragon-themed, which might conflict with the nature of your campaign, as not every setting runs dragons. So, being able to manifest draconic wings might seem a little strange in these cases, despite there not being any actual written restrictions on how you can take this feat. However, this can be mitigated by talking to your DM and maybe reflavor it to work in the current campaign setting being run if this feat is really something you'd be interested in running. Perhaps you can reflavor it as being a gift from a fae, celestial, or demonic being relevant to the campaign, which grants you the appropriate wings to manifest when you use your protective wings part of this feat. The overall usefulness, however, cannot be overlooked and definitely deserves a spot on this list for doubling as a flavor feat, as well for players that want access to more dragon-like features. Coming in at number 6, we have Tough. This is another simple feat that does nothing but increase the amount of hit points you have. You gain extra hit points equal to twice your level, and an additional 2 hit points every time you level up, granting you a total of 40 extra hit points by the time you reach level 20, which is a sizable difference for any character. This increase can work wonders for your frontline allies, as Tough allows them to take more punishment before going down. Taking this feat as a Barbarian is especially strong, since they can already have the damage of a bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage by default whenever they enter rage. And if you're a bear totem warrior barbarian, you can just become an absolute beef tank in terms of taking damage, since you would resist every damage type of the game except for psychic damage. You can also combine this feat with the Hill Dwarf's Dwarven Toughness feature, which allows them to gain one extra hit point whenever they level up, or even the Draconic Sorcerer's Draconic Resilience feature, which does the same thing, for a huge boost of hit points per level. This feat also benefits casters since it allows them to take a bit more punishment by bolstering your relatively small amount of hit points. You can also use Tough as a way to supplement your already high constitution score by granting you even more hit points. Or you can use Tough as a way to make up for a low constitution score by granting you the equivalent of a plus 2 modifier in your constitution. The reason Tough takes number 6 on this list, however, is due to how generically useful this feat is. There are no restrictions on who can take this feat, and there's no real downside to actually taking this feat other than missing out on other potential feats or your ability score increase, which is something to consider when taking feats anyway. The only real downside of this feat is mainly the fact that it doesn't provide any ability score increase, like some other feats do. However, the amount of hit points you gain for this feat already more than make up for it. 
and being able to survive just a little longer to pull off one more fireball or inflict a few more big hits before you go down can be a huge game changer in the long run, making this a fantastic option to pick up on this list. And at number 5 we have the Ritual Caster feat. This feat allows you to choose two first level spells that possess the Ritual Tag, which both come with a Ritual Book that you obtain whenever you take this feat. The spells must come from the spell list of one of the classes you choose whenever you take this feat, which are Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard. The class you choose also determines the spell casting modifiers you'll use whenever you cast these spells. Charisma for Bard, Sorcerer, or Warlock, Wisdom for Cleric or Druid, or Intelligence for Wizard. Additionally, you're able to add ritual spells that you might find in written form, such as a spell scroll or a wizard spellbook out in the open world, but only for spells of the class you've chosen and whose level can be no lower than half of your own level, rounded up. It costs 50 gold pieces per level the spell to copy down, and the process takes 2 hours per spell level to complete. This is useful if you're playing a class that can't normally cast spells as rituals, such as a sorcerer, or playing a class that can't cast spells at all, such as a fighter or rogue. For sorcerers, you wouldn't need to learn detect magic or expend any spell slots to cast it. A fighter might want to be able to read some ancient texts they find by taking comprehend languages. However, the most common reason Ritual Caster is taken is for the Find Familiar spell. This spell basically allows you to summon a familiar which lasts until you dismiss it forever or until tip points drop to zero, which means it can last an indefinite amount of time for the low cost of 10 gold pieces worth of material cost in order to cast the Find Familiar spell in the first place. And this familiar can do a lot of things, from scouting to assisting in combat by allowing you to effectively cast touch rain spells through familiar from a relatively long distance. But the most common way most familiars are used is by having them use the help action on their turn during combat in order to allow an ally that goes next to have advantage on their next attack. But the reason Ritual Caster only makes the number 5 spot on this list, despite how good Find Familiar is as a spell, is because this list is about feats that don't affect your damage. And one could argue that Find Familiar, using the help action, can indirectly increase the damage of whoever has advantage on their next attack by turning a miss into a hit, or the act of casting Shock and Grass to your familiar in order to disable that target's reaction from a distance. All of which can technically be seen as dealing more damage than you normally would have been able to, which isn't quite what we're looking for in this list. Despite this, however, there are still some relatively good, I believe niche, spells you can take with Ritual Caster that make this feat deserving of being on this list regardless. Detect Magic and Identify are both great for determining the properties of magical items without needing to first prepare or learn the spells in the first place, while also conserving spell slots for potential combat or encounters. Tensor's Floating Disc can help transport important goods your party might discover in a dungeon that they normally might be able to carry out themselves. Alarm can be used to help set up a defense system that can alert you and your party members of trespassers in an area, and the list goes on and on. There are also some decent ritual spells you might be able to learn at higher levels that can prove even more useful. At level 6, you can learn the third level of ritual spell, Phantom Steed, which allows you to conjure a horse-like creature that you can ride on. It takes on the stance of a riding horse, but possesses a speed of 100 feet and can travel 10 miles an hour. This can be a great way to have your Cavalier fighter have access to a mountain places where they normally wouldn't have access to, such as inside certain dungeons or interiors where horses might not be allowed or have a hard time maneuvering. This also just means you don't have to buy or rent a horse to travel on foot to wherever you need to go. And depending on time and how many party members you have, you could potentially provide enough horses for your entire party to ride, since the steed lasts for one hour and doesn't require concentration to maintain. Ritual Caster is a feat that has a lot of versatility when it comes to what you can learn from it, which is why this feat is still good enough to sit where it does on this list regardless. And at number 4, we have the Healer feat. This allows you to be more effective with the Healer's Kit by allowing you to restore one hit point whenever you use it to stabilize a dying creature, bringing that creature back into the fight if they were down in combat. However, this feat also offers the additional benefit of being able to use your action in order to tend to a creature's wound and heal them for 1d6 plus 4 hit points plus additional hit points equal to the maximum number of hit dice that creature possesses. The only caveat to this feature is that a creature can only be healed this way once per short or long rest. There are two things to note about this feat that makes it really good. The first is that it allows you to bring a creature back into fighting condition with very little resources spent, since you only need one hit point in order to be able to fight. The second thing is that the healing provided from this feat is actually pretty decent. For comparison, Cure Wounds heals a creature for 1d8 plus the caster's spellcasting modifier, which usually ranges between 3 to 5 depending on how the character is being built. However, the amount of healing you get from the healer feat is a lot more consistent and automatically scales as you level up. So if you're healing a party member who possesses a maximum of 5 hit dice, then the minimum amount of healing they can receive from this feat is 10 points of restoration, which is almost as good as the average amount of healing that a level 2 Cure Wounds can heal, which is around 13 points of healing, if we assume that when casting it has a plus 4 modifier to the spellcasting roll this early on in the game. So, if you're a healer and want to conserve your own spell slots, then this feat can definitely help with that. However, by far the best use of this feat is for someone who doesn't possess any way of healing at all, whether it's their spells or otherwise. 
A fighter being able to rush to someone's side and instantly heal them for a good chunk of hit points can be a massive boon to the party, and it can help alleviate the burden of your healer when things start to get intense. You can also use the healer's kit on everyone right before a short rest to grant additional healing and conserve hit dice for everyone, since you'll be able to heal them again right after the rest is finished. This feat can also work as a great flavor feat for battle medics who've had to learn how to bandage up their comrades while in the midst of battle, for instance. The healer feats flexibility and ability to heal a not so insignificant amount of health to allies whenever they may need some emergency healing is the reason why this feat ranks so high on this list, and definitely worth considering if your party might just need a little bit of additional healing support. And at number 3, we have Inspiring Leader. This feat lets you rally up your friends by inspiring them through demonstration of your resolve to fight. You spend 10 minutes to do this, and up to 6 friendly creatures in 30 feet of you will gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier as a result. There are a lot of similarities between this feat and the chef feat in terms of how they're used. However, the amount of temporary hit points provided by Inspiring Leader far outshines that of chef due to being tied to both your level and your charisma, as opposed to just your proficiency bonus, making this feat more useful even at higher levels. And while Chef does have the added benefit of restoring extra hit points during a short rest, Inspiring Leader has the potential to eliminate the need for the extra healing in the first place, due to the sheer amount of temporary hit points you can provide with it in the first place. Technically, this feat works best with characters that favor a high charisma stat like Sorcerers and Warlocks. However, Inspiring Leader works with pretty much any character with a decent charisma score, such as a fighter or rogue, while also being thematic depending on your preferences. And the reason this feat takes the number 3 spot on this list is mostly how useful being able to grant your party members an extra buffer can be at the end of every rest. And since there's no list of duration for how long these hit points last, we default to the rules for temporary hit points, which state that they last until you finish a long rest if there's no stated duration listed for the effect that granted those temporary hit points in the first place, making this feat really easy to use for almost any character that hasn't dumped charisma. And at number 2, we have Resilient. This feat has a simple effect where you choose any one ability score and increase it by 1, up to a maximum of 20. Then you gain proficiency in saving throws using whatever ability score you chose to increase. While this might not sound amazing on paper, the benefits of this feat actually are quite big. While you can definitely provide yourself some protection against oncoming attacks, like Fireball, by becoming proficiency in dexterity saving throws, the easiest way to use this feat is by making yourself proficient in constitution saving throws as a spellcaster. You see, whenever you're concentrating on a spell and you take any sort of damage, you have to make a concentration check in order to maintain concentration on your spell. The DC save for this is equal to half of the damage you take to a minimum of 10. So, if you're concentrating on slow, for example, and you're hit for 30 damage, you would have to pass a concentration check with a DC save of 15 in order to not drop concentration. And since concentration checks are considered constitution saving throws, being able to add your proficiency to this is actually very good if you want a better chance to not lose concentration on an important spell, like Hypnotic Pattern or Polymorph, both of which are spells that are strong enough to completely end some encounters when used well. And while a bit boring, being able to supplement an untrained proficiency can still help you avoid adverse effects by making yourself a little less likely to be hit by something that targets your dump stat, such as a Tasha's Mind Whip, a spell that targets intelligence, the most dump stat in the game by players that aren't playing a class which relies on it. The reason this feat sits at number 2 on this list is because it's useful for any character to take, and doesn't require to do anything special in order to gain access to his benefits. And even though there might be better options you could take, this is actually one of the only two feats in the game which allows you to choose any ability score to increase, rather than a couple of ability scores like the other feats, making this a very versatile feat which benefits anyone that takes it. And at number 1, we have the Alert feat. This feat makes you immune to being surprised while you're conscious, while also making it so creatures cannot gain advantage on attack rolls against you as a result of being unseen by you, usually due to being hidden or invisible. However, the most useful thing this feat does for you is grant you a plus 5 bonus to your initiative rolls. Other than a very select few subclass features, there are very little ways to increase your initiative roll outside of just having a high dexterity, making this a very powerful feat that benefits anyone that wants to improve their chances of going first, or at the very least, not going last. And pretty much any character wants to move before your enemy, because the sooner you can end the encounter, the less danger you have to face overall. A wizard that goes first, for instance, can open with a slow, which completely destroys action economy for your enemies by applying a plethora of debuffs, including lowering AC or dexterity saving throws, halved movement, and the ability to not be able to take reactions or more than one attack on their turn. A barbarian that goes first will have a better time entering rage and position themselves in bunch of front of targets before they ever get a chance to make a move, making it easier for creatures to focus their attention on the tanky damage sponge that decide to plop themselves down within arm's reach. A monk can also identify a key target and attempt to use their stunning strike feature as early as possible, potentially skipping that creature's turn if successful. Going first can be extremely important and can grant you and your party members advantage in ways that isn't always obvious, but can be game-changing all the same. 
You also have the added benefit of never being affected by the surprise condition as long as you're conscious, meaning you can still take your turn even if the rest of your party is caught off guard, which has its own set of benefits, which basically comes down to some of the possible actions previously mentioned. And just like Resilient, this feat heavily benefits any character that wants to take it, with basically no downsides, making this feat perfect for a number one spot. Alright, and that's the list. Do you have any more feats that you personally enjoy taking or using? Or do you have any ideas for future top 10 videos regarding feats or top 10 videos in general? If so, I'd love to hear about your ideas down in the comments.